in the period of time where Don Frank was being debated, and then shortly there uh, after its passage, I was writing a lot about how clearing was focused on addressing credit risk, and it did so by creating liquidity risk. And so the thing that is meant to reduce systemic risk can actually contribute to systemic risk because most systemic crises are at root liquidity crisis. That's why I think that mandating more clearing and mandating more exchange style marking to market and margining the way that Dodd-Frank did just set the stage for what we're observing now. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities and finance, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building Smarter Markets be the antidote? Welcome back to Systems at Risk on Smarter Markets. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at ABEX Technologies. Our guest today is Craig Perong, Professor of Finance and Energy Markets Director of the Global Energy Management Institute at the Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. We'll be discussing the economics, finance, and risk management of commodity trading firms with the Streetwise Professor. Hello, Craig. Welcome to Smarter Markets. Uh, It's my pleasure to be here. Now, you've spent a career thinking about the way commodity markets are organized and the way commodities are traded influences how well these markets work, and those insights are particularly relevant today. I want to get to talk with you about the chaos in the LME nickel market, the levels of funding liquidity risk that have had some commodity traders asking central banks, the ECB in particular, for emergency liquidity. And of course, the calls for more regulatory oversight into OTC markets and what it all means. But uh, to start off first at a high level, as someone who's given a lot of thought to commodity market structure and risk management, what's working well in the commodity markets under the current stress levels? And what are you seeing now that concerns you? Uh, well, uh, for the most part, yeah, the markets have survived uh, very stressful times uh, and done so pretty successfully. I mean, there have been uh, uh, so, you know, some difficult moments, particularly with the LME, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. But they've muddled through, let's put it that way. Uh, there have been some scary moments, but overall, the, the system has survived the, the stress pretty well. And are you seeing any points in the market that maybe we should be worried about not holding up so well going forward? Well, the yeah, the liquidity, uh, the the funding liquidity uh, aspect of the markets uh, is an ongoing concern. Uh, you know, we've uh, uh, had some scary moments, and not just uh, since the invasion, uh, but even going back to last fall. There was a uh, article in Bloomberg yesterday that uh, that ICE, uh, Europe uh, had a one billion dollar margin breach uh, back in September, I think, of last year. So I think that that's the the, the biggest ongoing concern. And it's related to the underlying uh, uncertainty across the entire commodity space because the, the war in Ukraine has, uh, has been a shock uh, that's hit uh, virtually every commodity. And also, at the same time, we're having uh, shocks coming from China with their renewed crackdown on COVID. So uh, it's a highly volatile fundamental environment, which is translating into big price moves, which translates into big margin calls and increases in initial margin. And you put all that together, it, it means that the liquidity, uh, funding liquidity has to be monitored closely. And I want to dig into that. Uh, as we turn now to some of the more recent events, and probably one of the the most notable to the general public things was the problems on the LME, the London Metals Exchange in the nickel market. And I'm curious, what lessons do you think we should be learning from the chaos on the LME? Could it have been prevented? Well, yeah, so that's uh, yeah, interesting question. We don't really know all what went on behind the scenes, but uh, what appeared on the surface is not a pretty picture. And you know, the underlying shock was the uh, Ukraine war, and disruptive uh, because uh, uh, Russia is a major nickel producer. Uh, nickel stocks were low, and so you would predict a big price uh, response to that. And then 
having a very large short present in the market, uh, who apparently was uh, unable to meet margin calls, led to panic covering, which led to prices uh, spiking to you know, multiples of what they had been before the uh, you know, before the event. So then the LME intervened and first of all stopped trading and then took the rather unprecedented step of tearing up trades. And yeah, that is something that raises a lot of questions and undermines the integrities of the uh, integrity of the markets going forward. And that's yeah, the, yeah that's where I think that the real scrutiny uh, has to be involved. And also um yeah, the, just the the you know the role of the way that the margining system works, uh, you know, can frequently lead to these sorts of uh, uh, of disruptions. Yeah, I wanted to get into a little bit more of your thoughts on the LME's response of canceling trades. As an economist, that certainly feels like something that's going to lead to unintended consequences down the road and introduce a, another level of moral hazard. What do you think some of those, you know, consequences might be of the LME's actions? Well, I think the the biggest consequences are going to be suffered by the LME and in the probably in the very short to medium term as probably the long term as well, which is is that it's basically undermined its reputation as sort of the you know, fair level playing field that is essential for an exchange to to operate. If it's viewed as being uh, rigged in one way or the other, or possibly rigged at all, uh, you yeah, that really undermines the uh, the utility of the market and market participants' willingness to use it. Also, I think that what happened probably also undermined market participants' confidence in the solvency of the clearinghouse. And I think that actually that's one of the things, you know, that the LME canceling trades was probably one of the signals that they were worried about, the solvency of the clearinghouse. And that will also be detrimental to the LME going forward. The problem is, is that uh, most exchange-traded commodities are traded pretty much on a single market. I mean, there's a lot of the research that I did in the early 2000s, late 1990s, was looking at the economic factors that cause uh, trading to concentrate on a single exchange. And as a result, uh, it's very difficult to move open interest and liquidity from one exchange to another exchange, even if that exchange has some serious problems. And so one of the downsides is, is that I think that the metals market in particular is going to be hamstrung by uh, an exchange, uh, which due to the stickiness of liquidity is going to be the, the main price discovery vehicle and hedging vehicle in the metals market uh, for the foreseeable future, even though it has undermined those functions through its own actions. Yeah, and I, I want to dig into that point a little bit more about the the real world implications of this because we see, you know, things happening on exchanges, and sometimes it can feel like it's just numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but you combine that, you know, not only did the Russian invasion of Ukraine have financial implications like it did for nickel on the LME, but you know, generally we've seen higher and more volatile commodity prices in in the wake of Russia's invasion. And commodity trading firms, as you said earlier, are facing much higher demands for cash margins against their hedges. So even though they're physically hedging the commodity, they have to post the cash margin for their, their futures market hedges. And that means that you know a lot more cash and risk has to be taken on for each barrel of oil or ton of metal that they're moving. And multi-billion dollar margin calls are becoming much more common and I'm curious your thoughts on how big a problem is this for the markets, and does that difficulty and, and greater challenging managing risk lead to less or more expensive food, energy, and materials for all of us? Well, so it, it definitely is going to impact the cost of intermediating physical commodities. Uh, so that's really what commodity trading firms, you know, the, the, the Glencores, Traffic Gears, Cargills, et cetera, do is that they are in the business of transforming commodities in space, time, and form. So they're taking it from where it's produced to where it's consumed. And, uh, you know, sometimes, not now, but uh, frequently they're storing the commodity and transforming it in time. But also they're engaging in processing activities and things of that nature. As part of that process, they're holding you know, large inventories of the physical commodities in order to carry out those functions. And they have to hedge that. 
and hedging has become much more expensive. And so that is going to increase the cost that they incur in order to intermediate commodities. And so one way to think about it is, you know, there's just going to be more, you know, more sand in the gears of getting commodities from producers to consumers, uh, more friction in that process, higher cost in that process. And so that's going to basically drive a wedge between uh, the prices that consumers and uh, rece- uh, pay and producers receive. And that wedge is going to get bigger. Uh, so, you know, downstream, it's going to mean that uh, commodity consumers are going to pay higher prices, but actually it means upstream that commodity producers are going to get uh, uh, less as well. And, um, you know, since the, both the demand and supply of most commodities is relatively inelastic, yeah, that wedge probably won't lead to that much change in the quantities that we consume, but it will, it will have an impact on prices. And in trying to think about, you know, potential ways to get some of the sand out of the gears and reduce the size of that wedge. Do you have thoughts on, is there a better way to manage the risk of, of the cash flow mismatches when hedging physical commodities with futures? Well, so that, yeah, that's yeah, sort of the, you know, the, the interesting issue, which is what is the uh, you know, optimal sort of contract structure. Uh, yeah, futures are marked to market and they're centrally cleared and they have been, you know, Chicago Board of Trade established its clearinghouse in 1925. And some markets were cleared in London and Europe you know, before that. Uh, so that's been part of the futures landscape before even I was around. But you know, particularly starting in the you know, end of the 20th century into the 21st century, uh, you know, over the counter markets that had essentially more flexibility in uh, these sort of financing arrangements that evolved. And then post financial crisis, Dodd Frank, which I refer to as Frank and Dodd because it was sort of a monster that uh, escaped control of its creators, you know, essentially said, oh, no, we're going to make everything futures like. We're going to you know, basically make OTC look very futures like and sort of impose the same kind of, of rigidity and, and essentially reduce market participants' flexibility in dealing with these things. And I think that that's one uh, negative legacy of, of went on in 2010 when Dodd-Frank was passed. And I think that that has contributed to, it didn't cause completely, but I think it has contributed to the, you know, the challenges of managing these liquidity risks. Yeah, I'd love to get into that a little bit more with you. Because for a long time, moving towards, you know, having everything, OTC swaps cleared on exchanges was almost seen as the panacea. Like, we're going to get all this OTC stuff cleared, and it'll be with the central counterparty at the clearinghouse, and then we'll all be fine. Why didn't that work? Ah, why didn't that work? Well, so I, for years and years, uh, I called myself the clearing Cassandra because I was uh, raising alarms as to why that might not work and, and particularly the circumstances under which it might not work. And uh, yeah, so in the period of time when Don Frank was being debated and then shortly there uh, after its passage, I was writing a lot uh, about um, how clearing was focused on addressing credit risk. And it did so by creating liquidity risk. Uh, It essentially made the system much more uh, dependent on access to liquidity in order to fund margin calls and to have, uh, you know, to to fund initial margins and things of that nature. And that wasn't going to be a problem until it was a problem. And when does it become a problem? It becomes a problem during periods of major market disruption. And so the, the, the thing that is meant to reduce systemic risk can actually contribute to systemic risk because liquidity, most systemic crises are at, at root liquidity crises. And uh, just as a bit of background, how did I become educated in this? Well, uh, I, when I was a small child in 1987, uh, I was working for a futures commission merchant on the CME and Board of Trade. And... I went into my boss's office on the morning of the 20th, and this was a guy who was uh, on the board of directors of the CME, and I said, uh, Brian, you don't look so good. He goes, well, the clearinghouse almost failed last night. And, well, why did the clearinghouse almost fail? Well, because somebody wasn't able, you know, was late making their margin payment, and and so uh, yeah, that's what sort of uh, sensitized me to the importance of these liquidity issues. And yeah, it just as sort of almost a sociological observation, those things were, um, those lessons were absorbed in the 
late 80s, early 90s. And then since we didn't have another episode like that, sort of the memories went away. And so you know, th- that's why I think that mandating more clearing and mandating more exchange style marking to market and margining uh, the way that Dodd-Frank did you know, set the stage for what we're observing now. I had an article, I think it came out in 2010, which says, you know, clearing and margin requirements, the new liquidity trap, question mark. And I think that that's what we're seeing. now. And it's such an important point that transforming credit risk to liquidity risk, regulators in the, the intent to reduce the risk to the individual party often can end up creating systemic risk to the whole thing. I'd love if you could walk through like an ex- maybe an undergraduate level example of, of how that works, of how you, you know, by trying to reduce the risk for a particular transaction or a subset of counterparties, you create this systemic risk in the market through the liquidity problems. So again, I, I think that the crash of 87 is a, a very good real world example. You know, so you had a you know, 20 standard deviation move in stock prices, you know, multiple you know, uh, double digit standard deviation moves in bonds and, and other you know, big financial markets. And whenever you have a big change in market prices, that leads to margin calls. And on net, it's just a dollar going from somebody's pocket to somebody else's pocket. So it looks like, you know, that there's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, uh, it's a transfer, but you have to come up with the cash in a very short time frame in order to meet that. And traders, uh, trading companies, uh, you know, have access to cash. They realize this, but they essentially size uh, their their access to, to liquidity based on you know, sort of normal events. And when you have a 20 standard deviation event, that's not a normal event. Uh, and frequently the uh, provisions that uh, companies had undertaken were inadequate. But the problem is, is that that, you know, that inability to come up with, you know, so even a somebody who's solvent that can't come up with cash in a hurry, if they can't come up with cash in a hurry, they f- don't make their margin payments and the clearinghouse doesn't have enough capital to absorb that, that can cause the entire system to melt down. And you know, again, going back to the crash of 87, things were actually sort of scarier on the day of the 20th because that's when concerns about the, the, the Chicago clearinghouses uh, you know, started to, to get really big. And that was, you know, that was a you know, scary moment. Um, and so you know, it, it's, it's those kind of things that they're, they're very unusual events, but when they do happen, they can have catastrophic consequences. Yeah, I've heard this discussed, um, this idea of the pro-cyclicality of margins mm-hmm. and the risk that creates, in that margins are typically related to the volatility in the market, yeah. so volatility goes up and then margins go up to cover the increase in risk, and as margins go up, people are forced to close positions, if as you said, if they can't raise the cash in a hurry, and then the forced closing of positions right. creates larger price moves, right. which creates more volatility, which creates higher margin requirements. Is there a way out of that type of loop? Well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. Conceptually, there are ways out of the loop. Uh, so that you know, basically, if you scale margins to you know, sort of worst case scenarios, and uh, didn't vary them over the volatility cycle, that would address the problem. The problem is that that's, it's not really credible for exchanges or regulators to impose such a system because they're, they're during the normal times, so let's say you go through the great moderation of the, you know, the first decade, the first seven or eight years of the 2000s, Oh gee, why do we have these big margins? You know, the world's moderate now, volatility is real low, and so there's always pressure to reduce uh, initial margins uh, during normal times. And then the the inherent logic of the way that clearers work, clearing houses work, in order to preserve themselves, leads them to say, "Hey, volatility is way up. We're facing much more credit risk. We got to jack up margins." And it seems like there's a cyclicality and regulatory oversight as well. And of course, with high commodity prices Absolutely. and volatile commodity prices, we're now hearing the greater calls for 
more regulatory oversight of the commodity markets and, you know, Mm -hmm. this time in particular, the OTC markets. And I was curious, Mm -hmm. uh, what do you make of this? You know, are commodity trading firms too big or maybe too essential to fail? And is that going to change the regulatory structure? Uh, so I, I think, first of all, there are a couple of points I'd like to make a preface to, as preface to answering that. Yeah, so first of all, regulators are lagging indicators. Uh, yeah, they're like generals. They tend to fight the last war. And, you know, the other thing is, is that, that regulators always start from the perspective of well, what additional regulations can we add as opposed to stepping back and say, hey, maybe it's the stuff we did before is contributing to this problem and they, maybe we need to back off. So, you know, that never happened. Um, or seldom happens. In terms of commodity trading firms uh, themselves, so I wrote a series of white papers in 2014-2015 on commodity trading and commodity trading firms, and one of them was specifically addressing this issue of are they too big to fail? And uh, so so the question is, is it whether a failure, There are two questions. One question is whether a commodity trading firm can fail. Yes, it can fail. The second question is whether the failure of a commodity trading firm itself could have a spillover effect and cause a systemic crisis. And my answer to that question was and remains to be uh, that uh, that no, sort of a, you know, know, let's say you have a big commodity trading firm that has a rogue trader problem or something and it it goes bankrupt or it makes a, uh, you know, takes a spec play and, and loses a lot of money, which has happened to commodity trading firms uh, in the past. So look at uh, uh, Mark Rich uh, back in the late 80s. Uh, you know, so that can happen. And but usually that's not going to have a lot of spillover effects. Commodity trading firms are not like banks in terms of their size, number one. Uh, you know, the biggest commodity trading firm would be about the same size of banks that you've never heard of. You know, also, uh, you know, they're less important in terms of providing capital. Uh, so it's not like the, you know, the capital supply mechanism is going to be uh, that much impacted. And a lot of their, you know, their assets can be redeployed. So even if one company's financially insolvent, you know, somebody else can step into its shoes and take on its people, take on its assets. Uh, and continue to intermediate uh, commodities. Yeah, that's so. I think that more the issue is is that that systemic. Sh- it's not so much that commodity trading firms are going to cause uh, you know, their problems are going to cause systemic shocks. Is that they are more likely to be under stress when there are big systemic shocks. And so I think that that's what we're observing right now. You know, imposing additional regulations on them doesn't seem you know, to really address you know, that particular issue. And I suppose in terms of thinking, are they too essential to fail? The fact that their assets and operations could be absorbed by uh, a competitor or someone else in the market would mean that the, the supply lines would keep moving, even if one were to, yeah. to run into solvency issues. Is that right? Yeah. And, and that's, and there's a, a yeah. It's not a happy example, but there's a great example of that from the United States energy markets in the early 2000s. So you had the Enron thing, but it was really when the Dynegy was under SEC regular, uh, investigation for its accounting. I think it was in uh, April of 2002, so almost exactly 20 years ago. Uh, and then you know, basically people started turning over a, a lot of rocks in uh, uh, the merchant energy space and merchant energy firms were essentially just, you know, they were commodity traders fo- uh, focusing on uh, natural gas and electricity markets in the United States. And from April 19 or uh, a- April 2002, I think through about June, you look at a portfolio of the prices of merchant energy companies and they fell by about 90% in value. Several of them went bankrupt. But gas continued to flow flip the switch in your house and the lights came on. And you know, so the, 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 uh, you know, the operation of the real assets uh, was you know, somewhat distinct from the, uh, the, the financial solvency of the companies. I, I wanted to step away for, for a moment uh, from some of the most recent events, but talk about some trends in the industry and, and get your thoughts on them. Like in recent years, there, there seems to be a push by exchanges to move more towards cash settled instruments, cash settled futures, and away from physically settled. And more recently, there's been more of a push towards uh, real time clearing, you know, kind of 
promoted in part by FTX. And I was curious, uh, someone who looked a lot at market structure, what do you make of these moves of, you know, cash versus physical and trying to have more real-time clearing? Yeah, well, in terms of delivery sediment, I've always been a skeptic about uh, cash sediment. And there's some events over the past couple of decades that illustrate that, and I'll try to touch on those. Um, but basically, in order to have effective cash settlement, you have to have observable cash market prices with, in markets with sufficient liquidity and sufficient transactions to make those prices reliable and relatively unsusceptible to manipulation. So, for example, you can have a, a cash settled S&P 500, and that's fine. You've got a very liquid markets for S&P 500 stocks. So, you know, we've a, a, a futures exchange can essentially uh, utilize the price discovery that takes place uh, on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, et cetera, in order to cash settle its index. That works. But you, know, you, you sort of run out of examples of things like that. In the, in the OTC energy space, what are the most liquid uh, cash settle contracts? Well, they're NYMEX lookalikes. Well, how do those work? Well, they're basically utilizing the prices discovered in the markets for physically delivery settled uh, natural gas and you know, natural gas and oil. Um, and so, yeah, so it, but then you go beyond that and you look for other things that are cash settled. You know, you, you run into you know, uh, you know a lot of problems, and so you know, I mentioned the merchant energy meltdown in early two thousand two. Uh, one of the things that came out of that was that people dug into what was going on with cash settlement in uh, natural gas uh, contracts in the United States. Uh, there's natural gas indices, and there was you know, widespread fraud and manipulation. People went to jail. Uh, you look at cash settlement in the interest rate markets. Well, that was what LIBOR was like. And now they're trying to get rid of LIBOR and move to a delivery settle type of, uh, of, of instrument in order to uh, address those problems. And you know, the, the basic problem in commodity markets is that the physical markets are not that liquid. They're not that transparent. They don't have a lot of transactions necessarily. And you know, that all makes it very difficult to create a, a truly cash settled commodities contract. And Again, I think for commodities, historically speaking, you look at the best way to achieve convergence. Uh, the best way to achieve convergence is have a well-designed physical uh, delivery setup. And I think you've said in the past, um, you know, when, when you hedge, you exchange price risk for basis risk. <laughs> yeah. And sort of the cash settlement mechanism in itself can create some basis risk because if you're if you're, if you're basing contracts off a you know, relatively small number of transactions, or and maybe those transactions could be the result of attempts to move the indices, um, you know that adds noise, which creates uh, which creates basis risk. Right. And the, I want to also want to ask you um, about moving towards more real time clearing because I think mm -hmm. of the you know you called yourself earlier the Cassandra of clearing mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if we try to make it more real time are there are there risks to that or is that a beneficial thing to do or some mix well yeah so you know again, I mean I think it's you know a double edged sword and I think it exacerbates some of the problems that I that you discussed earlier so first of all so you know the FTX is one example it's not exactly the same but you look at the move hey let's go yeah you know, so hey you know, Two day settlement in the stock market, or one day settlement's too long. We need to you know, sort of compress the settlement window in the stock market, which was uh, something that was, uh, you know, came up after the GameStop fiasco of uh, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago. Uh, you know, sort of the same sort of ideas. And again, you know, these are ways of saying, hey, how can we reduce credit risk? Well, make things real time so that. People's collateral is always uh, in line with the uh, credit exposures that they create. And fine, okay, so you're going to reduce credit risk. How are you going to do that? Well, you know, you make it more dependent on liquidity. And, and also, if you do it, you know, if, if, you say, oh, yeah, devil's always in the details. If you create a real-time mechanism, well, how are you going to basically, what if somebody doesn't, you know, meet their, you know, they don't have enough excess margin in their account. And so uh, they get a margin call and they don't meet it. Well, you're going to liquidate positions. Okay. Well, if you're going to do that in a mechanical manner, uh, that can create potential for destabilization. So let's say we have move, uh, a move in price. And so then that mechanically forces a lot of liquidations, like you discussed earlier, which can exacerbate the move in the prices 
and you, know, you create those sort of uh, positive feedback loops and markets, positive feedback loops, loops usually have negative consequences. And also it creates opportunities for uh, gamesmanship. So, you know, somebody, you know, so, you know, an old game in markets is gunning the stops. And if I know where the stops are and I can force uh, the, the price down to where a bunch of stops get triggered and then that's going to move the price more, I can cover it up favorable price. Well, this is basically creating you know, a system of stops uh, that can be potentially a game. So, yeah, so there, yeah, so yeah, again, it's a trade-off. The whole idea here is that you uh, want to find ways of reducing credit risk, shortening the settlement cycle, shortening the market to market cycle uh, does that, but it creates these other consequences. And it's not obvious as to what the, uh, you know, the right trade-off is. And a lot of the debate about real-time e-margin, to me, is just focused on the benefits and really hasn't taken cognizance of these costs. Yeah, so I'd love to to hear how you how you weigh off all these trade-offs. So if we were to put you on the spot and make you king of the world, if you could design a better commodity trading system, what would some of the key elements of that market structure be? Well, so I, I would yeah, go back to a system that offers more... You know, more choice and more flexibility. And so, you know, I think, uh, you know, in, in the, the first instance, that uh, one of the best things to do would be to revisit and potentially roll back, you know, a lot of what was done in Dodd Frank because, um, you, know, it, you know, again, it presumed that market participants were not, didn't have the right incentives to trade off these liquidity and credit risk considerations and sort of imposed a solution on them. And I think that there are diverse transactors in the marketplace, and you need diverse uh, trading mechanisms in order to accommodate that diversity. And you know, sort of the Dodd Frank is going towards a one size fits all type approach. And I think we need to move away from that one size fits all approach. And you know, sort of uh, you know, revisit the demonization of over counter markets as they existed prior to 2010, for example. Right. Back when I worked at Goldman, there was always the the, the OTC markets provided more role for customization, and the mm-hmm. the standardization of the exchanges allowed for more liquidity and price discovery. So it sounds like you know the the, the key elements, the the big thing for you would be rolling back the some of Dodd Frank, the, the the emphasis on pushing everything onto clearinghouses and onto exchanges. That would require a pretty big regulatory regime shift. Well, well you said I was king of the world, so I didn't, you know, so. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. You called me on it. So in the uh, likely event that that doesn't happen, what are some things that, you know, private participants or, you know, groups like the industry can do to try to improve the market so it can better under better withstand periods like we're seeing and we may see in the future. Are there are there some things you'd say? Okay, this is an area that's that's worth focusing on that that the private industry can make a more resilient market where you can better manage risk and get better prices ultimately for the end users. Yeah. So the yeah the key here, particularly when you're talking about commodity markets and the kinds of things that we talked about earlier, it is. You know, essentially, uh, you know, improving the coordination between banks, essentially providing uh, the, the funding uh, for commodity trading firms uh, and the commodity trading firms themselves. You know, potentially developing uh, new types of you know, credit lines or you know, ways of modifying credit lines that can be more responsive to the kinds of, of uh, events that we've seen uh, recently. So I think that that's, you know, that, you know, so essentially, you know, if you can't sort of improve flexibility on the, uh, you know, the margining side and allow, you know, sort of the establishment of credit relationships uh, that are more flexible through OTC arrangements, well, then that basically says, hey, let's see if we can find more flexible ways to size credit lines in response to uh, changed uh, economic circumstances. So that sounds like a, an enduring role for the banks and the extension of credit, even in you know markets with exchanges and a lot of participants. Yeah, that's one thing that always you know, drove me crazy. It's a short trip, but it was that you know, people sort of treated clearing and the banking systems in isolation, and that was and and that was really not the way to look at systemic risk. The, the whole thing about systemic risk is that they're all part of the system, and that something happens over on the clearing side. 
uh, sloshes over to the banking side, and you can't treat those things separately. Thanks again to Craig Perong, Professor of Finance at the University of Houston. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Join us next week when our guest will be Mike Prokop, Managing Director in Digital Transformation and Sustainability at Alliance Risk Group. Mike has more than 30 years of experience in the energy risk management industry and has advised numerous energy companies on risk management in the natural gas, crude oil, power, and LNG markets. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by ABAX. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial, and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees and producer, ABEX Technologies, shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening and please join us again next week.